Tonight, China is making things a little headachey for Google. Beats the future where the Apple is up in the air. And is HTC going to make that new Nexus tablet? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 177 for Monday, September 22nd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Citrix ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter TN2. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. The Chinese government continues to tighten internal security at a cost to many foreign companies, particularly Google. A chief technology officer of a startup in China tells the New York Times, under the condition of anonymity, that just using Google Drive in China has become a challenge for employees to share files and documents. Not only that, but Google used to have a third of China's market for internet searches. That was back in 2009. Today, that number's down to 10.9% after sensors in the company began blocking more and more searches from reaching Google servers. Now, the company shut down servers in mainland China back in March 2010. That was to avoid online censorship, instead sending users to unfiltered results from its servers in Hong Kong. The rules are different there. The Chinese government then began blocking intermittently the Hong Kong servers as well. That's a practice that continues today. Google's App Store, Google Play, is only partially accessible in China. The list goes on. Now, all of this creates an impression with many Chinese users that Google doesn't have very strong services. The sensors permit just a fraction of traffic to reach those servers in Hong Kong. Then many Chinese users reload their Google pages repeatedly in the hope of getting through. And unsurprisingly, China's state-controlled media is not doing all that much to set the record straight. Kind of a mess all around. All right, Apple bought Beats Music and Beats Electronics earlier this year for $3 billion. We remember that. Today, TechCrunch is reporting that the company plans to shut down Beats Music, although an Apple PR rep, Tom Newmayer, tells Recode that that story isn't true. Recode speculates that Apple won't actually shutter the Beats streaming service, but might change the Beats Music brand, though it probably won't touch the Beats headphone service, which already has pretty strong name recognition. It should probably be called something besides Beats. Knowing Apple. Speaking of Apple, the company announced it sold more than 10 million iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus devices in its opening weekend, which is a new record for the company. The company's iPhone sales record is twice what it was in 2012, a million more than in 2013. In September of 2013, Apple said that it had sold 5 million iPhone 5 models three days after launch. That was 2012, rather. And then last year in 2013, with the iPhone 5S and iPhone 5C, the company sold 9 million in three days. However, more units sold plus more expensive units mean more money for Apple. But screw Apple. Let's talk about BlackBerry. The company plans to sell its new smartphone, the Passport, at a lower price than rival products in an attempt to regain some of its market share that it has really lost. BlackBerry CEO John Chen said in an interview today that the Passport will cost about $599 in the U.S. without subsidies when it goes on sale this Wednesday, although the initial launch is limited to London, Toronto, and Dubai. The handset has a 4.5-inch square screen and a physical keyboard that BlackBerry diehards will like and will be the first global launch of a device since the company's BlackBerry 10 phones launched last year to very little fanfare. Chen says that the phone's larger screen will appeal to users who need to be more productive on their phones, such as people working in the medical field, and that the battery will last 36 hours and a large antenna will benefit reception. Big old antenna. AT&T has teamed up with Samsung as the exclusive carrier to offer the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, which will go on sale on September 26th. The Galaxy Alpha has a 4.7-inch form factor with HD resolution, 2.5 gigahertz quad-core processor, 2 gigabytes of RAM, a 12-megapixel camera, and 32 gigabytes of internal storage. Good get, AT&T. Sony first announced the PlayStation Vita TV set-top box in Japan last year. It was even a, over a year ago. 
Today, the company is finally announcing that device for the U.S. market. It's priced at $99.99. The device streams video content and gives users access to play any PlayStation Vita game on their big screen TV. Or for a price of $139.99, you can get the PlayStation TV, a DualShock 3 controller, an 8GB memory card, a USB cable, because who doesn't need one of those, an HDMI cable, and the Lego Movie game. Sony says that nearly 700 games will be supported at launch in the U.S. and Canada on November 14th, and pre-orders are now open. Oculus showed off its new prototype called Crescent Bay over the weekend at the Oculus Connect conference. The Crescent Bay has a faster frame rate, 360-degree head tracking, and an integrated headphones. It's lighter than the previous prototype as well. It's getting better all the time. Oculus also announced the new Oculus platform, which is coming to the Samsung VR virtual reality, which brings... VR to mobile apps, web browsers, and a VR content discovery channel. Great for developers. The Crescent Bay is not an official developer kit, but it's a feature prototype designed to show off the future of what the company is doing, which is similar to the pre-DK2 Crystal Cove prototype. The Crescent Bay probably won't ship to developers, but can prepare them for what Oculus puts into the DK3 category or that next developer kit, which VR makers will be able to buy. Coming up, why you might be getting served legal papers via Facebook. And up next, I'll talk with Eric Limer from Gizmodo about some reports that HTC is making that new Nexus tablet. But first, we all rely on email to communicate with clients and coworkers. Everybody uses email. We're exchanging files. You might need to, you know, send somebody legal papers, a contract of some kind, or share a spreadsheet, presentations, photos. We're all collaborating, but if you're sending confidential documents, sensitive documents as regular email attachments, that might be kind of risky. You've got file size restrictions or bounce backs or people with you know inboxes that are clogged. Security breaches scares everybody these days. You need to know about Citrix's share file product. Instead of attachments, Citrix share file sends your documents as secure links. You can send files of almost any size. You have a lot more control over that. You can also control who has access to these files. You can limit how long they have access. You can receive email alerts when files are open so you know exactly who's seen what and reviewed. Plus, Citrix share file is really easy to use. It makes you more efficient. It keeps everyone on your team on the same page because your shared folders are syncing automatically. And most importantly, or very important to me anyway, you can access your files from anywhere because you know we're all working all over the place these days using your computer or your mobile device. Twit uses share file like millions of other professionals and it just makes collaboration easy. You're working with a team, you're working with clients, you want to make sure that you are as organized as possible and share file is great for that. You can sign up today for a 30-day free trial. No obligation. You get those 30 days completely free. Just go to sharefile.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter TN and the number 2. Remember, sharefile.com and type in TN2. Get those free 30 days. And thanks to Citrix for sponsoring us with Sharefile. All right. Joining us now is Eric Limer, Associate Editor over at Gizmodo. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Well, it's good to have you back. So let's talk about this whole HTC making Google's new Nexus tablet. What's the story? Yeah, so um, there have been there have been rumors of a of a Nexus Nine tablet floating around for a couple of months now. I, I think they they started around July, um, and this is after there were uh, there were tons of rumors about uh, a Nexus Eight, an eight inch Nexus tablet before that that was supposed to be made by LG, and then that sort of never really happened. Uh, this time, it looks like uh, it looks like uh, we could see a uh, eight point nine inch tablet. Um, and uh, the rumors that have been coming out recently just uh, confirmed today um, from reports from the Wall Street Journal and, and backed up by The Verge is that uh, we're going to see an a 8.9-inch um, Nexus tablet made by uh, HTC, who hasn't made a tablet in years. So I guess the most obvious question is why HTC? If HTC is not necessarily known as the, you know, the, the brand to make the best tablet, how did they, how did they get this? Um, I don't know. That's actually a pretty good question. I think part of it probably has to do with um, 
uh, with uh, Google's tendency, you know, they, they move the, the uh, Nexus companies around from, from company to company. And it's been a while since uh, HTC has had an opportunity to make anything. They made the, the Nexus One? The, they made, you know, a, a, uh, a Nexus One, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, they made. Well, they made the they made a Nexus phone uh, a couple of years ago. Right. Um, I forget which one it was. Uh, <laughs> it would. It was. It was a while back. So it, it's kind of their turn for uh, for for a little bit of love, but also like um, HTC's design sense has come a long way since they made that last tablet. I think it was the the flyer in in 2011. I mean, the HTC the HTC One and the one that followed it are both are both really great designs, and it, it'd be it'd be great to see uh, to see that come into a tablet with like those front facing speakers. It, it could be uh, it could be a really nice device. All right. Well, you mentioned front facing speakers. Uh, if Google wants to work with HTC, any other cool design features that have been uh, rumored or that we should expect? Well, so um, uh, one of the things that I think is, uh, is is really compelling about it is it's rumored to have uh, a NVIDIA uh, K1 Tegra processor, um, which is uh, – NVIDIA announced that uh, back at CES. It, it's sort of uh, their mobile processor that, that's aiming to really sort of uh, – to, to uh, merge uh, some of the desktop architecture stuff with some of the mobile architecture stuff. Uh, it already showed up in Nvidia's Shield tablet, and it's it's fantastic. Um, it's it's powerful enough on uh, on Android to um, to run games like uh, older ish games like uh, Portal Two and Half Life Two, but it it can run them really well, and and uh, and it's going to be great to have that um, in if that comes out in a Nexus tablet that'll get developers uh, using that a little bit more, and and the uh, the potential for that for for mobile gaming is is really cool. We've got people in our chat room uh, sort of saying, yeah, HEC has great hardware. So it sounds like as far as the partnership with Google goes, this is potentially a really good thing. Why do you think Google wants to move its Nexus line around with 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 different manufacturers as the years go on? What What is the strategy there? Is it just because they, they haven't figured out the perfect tablet yet? Um, I think that's part of it. But another part of it is trying to keep everybody happy and and somewhat on a and kind of on a leash like uh to to um you know uh convince uh hardware makers not to stray too far by giving them by giving them a chance to like you know team up directly with Google to uh to create this sort of flagship device that that uh Google can showcase to be like well HTC maybe you don't need to be doing so much sense stuff because look how great it is when we work together and you stock Android and and we you know promote this tablet as this is this is going to be the Nexus tablet uh, it looks like there there aren't really many rumors about any uh, any other tablets coming out it, it's been uh, the, the Nexus the Nexus 10 that Samsung did uh, solely disappeared the Nexus 7 has been out of stock for a while so it, I think it just gives uh, it gives Google an opportunity to you know to uh, partner up and sort of and sort of spread the love around, and especially now that they don't have uh, they don't have Motorola, their own uh, hardware manufacturer anymore. You know, they they need to need to uh, you know make sure that they they uh, go around and and give all the different OEMs a, a little spot in the sunlight to to uh, help make the Google device for however long a year. Yeah, it becomes much less awkward when they don't use their own hardware line. Yeah, so. a lot less. Awkward. <laughs> It's just like Google is now free. Any thoughts on availability? Um, so the it's supposed to be announced relatively soon. Um, the the rumors are saying some of them are saying late Q3, which is like end of the month, uh, early Q4. Um, so I'm I'm not sh exactly sure about availability. It'll probably be pretty soon after announcement, but uh, the announcement's likely to be. Uh, this fall, probably around the same time, if not the exact same time, that the uh, that the official version of Android L comes out, complete with uh, whatever uh, its name is going to be. It's probably have some sort of confection name. So all of that stuff will probably probably pop at the same time. I would say in the near future, with within a month. If it's if it doesn't happen within the next month, I'd be very surprised. Eric Limer is the associate editor over at Gizmodo. Thanks for being back with us, Eric, and let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yep, you can find my work over uh, on gizmodo.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Limer. Excellent. We'll see you again soon.
All right. All right. Moving on. I uh, mentioned the whole serving papers via Facebook. What do I? What am I talking about? In a court ruling, a little b- bizarre, a Staten Island man received permission to use Facebook to serve his ex-wife legal notice. This was involving child support payments. So a family court official ruled that Noel Biscocho could use Facebook to serve Anna Maria Antigua because other methods, traditional methods, to serve her with papers had not worked. She had moved. There was no forwarding address. Her phone was cut off, etc., except that she had maintained an active social media account with Facebook and had even liked some photos posted on Facebook by his second wife as recently as July. So she was, you know, she was around. Staten Island Support Magistrate Gregory Gleedman noted in his September 12th order that it was the first of its kind in New York and also the first in the United States that didn't involve an attempt to serve someone who is overseas. Well, that's where you can find her. I guess that's where she gets her papers. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but hey, it's Facebook. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. It's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's the morning edition of the show. Until then, I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.